My name is Deb Van Dynan. I'm an Associate Professor of English Education at Hope College, and I have the honor of being the NEA Big Read and Little Read Lakeshore Director. The NEA Big Read Lakeshore and Little Read Lakeshore programs are month-long community-wide reading programs focused on the reading of a common book. This year, because of COVID, we've switched to a mostly virtual program. We're excited for the possibilities that this presents us as we can expand our audience's scope and reach, as well as our ability to connect with speakers and experts that are beyond our geographical reach. Thank you for joining us this year as we explore Nathaniel Kilberg's In the Heart of the Sea and Marsha Diane Arnold's Galapagos Girl Gallup Game. We hope you enjoy these events and learn lots about the books, topics, and themes, as well as issues and important questions in our world today. Hey, hi, John. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Pretty excited. <laughs> this is a wonderful thing you folks are doing. Yes. Hi, Sarita. Hi, what? let me start off by introducing John Yelding before we jump into the discussion. I wanted to start off by saying hello, all. My name is Tabitha Burink. I'm a part of the NEA Big Read Lakeshore team. I want to start off by saying a huge thank you to Gentex Corporation for underwriting this event. I also have the opportunity of introducing Dr. John Yelding. Dr. John Yelding has been preparing Hope College students to become teachers since 1994. John teaches many courses that introduce students to diversity related issues. In addition, he co-directs the Hope May term, a travel study course that gives students from any department on campus the opportunity to work with school children in a culturally diverse urban setting. He also developed a June term course in 2018 that focused on the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, which includes an eight day tour of historic sites in the South. Last but not least, he is heavily engaged in the diversity initiatives on Hope College's campus. Throughout, event, for, throughout the event, feel free to send as many questions as you'd like in the comment section, and we will try to answer them all. I will now hand things off to Dr. John Yelding, who has the honor of introducing the author, Skip Finley. Thank you so much, Pat Tabitha. That's a, a wonderful introduction. As we begin this evening's conversation, let me just quickly go over what you can expect in terms of how we will proceed. In just a moment, I will begin introducing our guest speaker, who's the author of the book, Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy. I will then turn to him to share more about himself before beginning our question and answer portion of this event. We invite any and all questions and I will do the very best that I can to uh, make sure that we select a variety of questions for him to respond to. It is my privilege to introduce to you our very special guest for this evening's conversation. He was the weekly Oak Bluffs Town columnist for the Vineyard Gazette from June 2012 to June 2017, and is a retired broadcaster who has written for and been featured or quoted in most media industry trade publications. He built his career in radio, becoming a well-known executive and station owner. He has served as the vice chairman of the National Association of Broadcasters, as chairman of the Radio Advertising Bureau, and on virtually all broadcasting industry boards of directors and on their executive committees. Since 1971, his career in media has included responsibility for 44 radio stations, five of which he owned, that encompassed a total of 18 markets. His experience includes successes with radio networks, syndicated programs, formats, and a satellite channel. Having repeatedly attempted to retire since age 50, he keeps returning to the field of communications. He currently serves as Director of Sales and Marketing for the Vineyard Gazette Media Group on Martha's Vineyard, where he has summered since 1955 and lived since 1999, having by then made the decision to become a writer. 
He has written articles for the Vineyard Gazette, Martha's Vineyard Magazine, Island Weddings Magazine, the Provincetown Banner, and the Martha's Vineyard Museum Publications, the in Intelligencer, and the MV Museum Quarterly. His historic, his excuse me, his book, Historic Tales of Oak Bluffs, is now available, published by ArcadiaPublishing.com slash the History Press. His most recent work, Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy, is published by the Naval Institute Press and was released on June 15th of 2020. It is, of course, the focal point of our conversation this evening. A gifted researcher, he is also an entertaining speaker with an interesting and finely tuned sense of humor. Please join me in giving a big Hope College and Greater Highland Community virtual welcome to our special guest, Mr. Skip Finley. John, thank you very much. Thank you all of us, all of you for joining us tonight. <clears throat> uh, I have yes. so much I want to tell you uh, about uh, whaling captains of color and whaling, and and I thought it'd be useful to try to focus that. I'm going to I'm going to start tell you a little bit about myself. Um, yep. it, it turns out I'm not the most mature person, um, and you know from the background that John has read to you, you know there's nothing in there that would suggest I was either intelligent enough or diligent enough or knew anything about black whaling captain because that's all true. In fact, the newspaper I work for, the Vineyard Gazette, also owns Martha's Vineyard Magazine. And this story starts when the folks at Mystic, Connecticut, at the Mystic Seaport decided they were going to restore and relaunch the famous whale ship to Charles W. Morgan, which today is the only whale ship that's remaining. It's also the second oldest ship in America after the USS Constitution. This was a huge deal in its many years of whaling. It was also very big on the island of Martha's Vineyard, as I'll share with you. But the editor of Martha's Vineyard Magazine asked me if I'd like to write an article for that issue, which was completely devoted to the return of the, um, of the whale ship, the Charles W. Morgan, about the black whaling captain, William A. Martin. And of course, as a brand new writer, I was delighted to write anything. And for writing for a magazine, now this is big time. So anyway, I started doing some research about this whaling captain, you know, William A. Martin. Uh, and I was stunned to find that a black man had become a captain of a whale ship in the 1880s. Uh, one thing led to another, thanks to my immaturity. Um, I, I also um, suffer, if you will, from ADHD, and I'm a victim of OCD. So once I got involved in this researching this man, I just kind of lost my mind and went crazy. It didn't take too long to find out. Not only was William A. Martin not the only whale ship captain who was black, person of color, um, but he wasn't even close to being the first one. He's about the 30th or 35th, as I, as I recall right now. One thing leading to another, getting completely carried away. I think I had invested maybe $3,500, $4,000 on books about whaling, um, some of which you see over there behind me. You know, or that's another way of saying I, I own almost all the books on whaling. I read each of these books. Um, I was delighted because it's such a fascinating subject. I took notes. I put the notes on the spreadsheet. I kept them and I kept doing and doing. Before I knew it, I discovered that there were, you know, at least a dozen of these fellas. Um, and then I found more and more and more. And, you know, hence what is what has come to be known now as um, Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy. At that point, I want to, you know, again, you know, you know, narrow that focus. Um, in coming up with the title, you know, for the book, um, it didn't take long to realize that whaling was an industry that occurred from the late 1600s until just about exactly 1928. Over half of the time, it was a vibrant industry, and by vibrant industry, whaling was the fifth largest industry in the state of Ma in, in the United States and the third largest industry in the state of Massachusetts for well over 200 years. A lot of people made a lot of money harvesting these huge, the hugest, the largest animals on the entire planet. Um, and they did that to harvest their oil to use for us to be able to read in our homes, to light our streets, to heat our homes, and ultimately lubricated the entire industrial revolution by the time it came around. 
But in those years, particularly those earlier years prior to 1865, there really wasn't such a thing as a black American because the black people who had been slaves and brought here from, Ar from, from Africa um, didn't get to be Americans until they were freed. So there was an issue right there. And then as I went on, come to find out, it wasn't just black people as we know black people because some of these folks were West Indians and you can't really characterize a West Indian as an American. Um, and then I found that there were Native Americans from here who fundamentally founded the industry of whaling, not the industry as we know it, but the act of going out, hunting a whale, capturing it, killing it, bringing it back home and harvesting its parts into useful food and material. Uh, I then discovered it wasn't just black people and West Indians and Native Americans. It was also the Cape Verdean community. Um, and the Cape Verdeans, although they are from Africa, the, you know, Cape, Cabo de Verde, the country is off the west coast of Africa. Um, you know, yes, it's a polyglot, as we call society. So, you know, it represents pretty much all the races of the world, but it's fundamentally an African country. Despite that, from what I learned in my research, um, color is, is, is a construct that the that the European was able to provide to all of us. <clears throat> um, that construct, you know, doesn't really stand up in the light of day genetically as we find. It doesn't stand up for a lot of reasons as we find out. But I learned that a lot of these men self-identified and that was very important, you know, to me, you know, in, in writing the book. And that kind of brings us what I would like to focus on tonight. I know we don't have a lot of time. Yes, I can sit here and talk and ramble for about an hour and maybe tell a joke or two, and you might find some of that interesting. But I wanted to focus this, since it's November, it happens to be uh, Native American Heritage Month. And quite often, what, what I've learned is, um, if it's not written, it never happened. And our history is the one that we choose to write, that we choose to commit to paper, so other people don't have to tell our stories for us. The Native American community, you know, were the ones to build the small canoes. Those canoes are replicated by what we call the whale ships that people use to hunt whales today. Similar size, about 30 feet long, very light, very thin, so that people, so that six folks can row rapidly towards catching, you know, this whale. So there's a lot of heritage, you know, that, that the Native American community has brought to it. And as we go through the presentation, you'll see some pictures. I'm going to talk about some of the people because what we also found out, the first whaling captain of color was a man named Paul Cuffey, whose name you may or may not have heard. Most people, when they think of this subject, they have pretty much heard Paul Cuffey's name. In fact, his dad was, from, was an African. He was a slave and ultimately freed. His mom was a Wampanoag Indian from here on Martha's Vineyard. So he was essentially what, what, what Cuffey called himself was a musty, a peculiar expression of the word mulatto, you know, where I guess, you know, a mulatto would be someone whose parentage is black and white, and a musty is one whose parentage is black and Native American. You know, which is again, these another one of these, you know, social constructs we find so important today. But another famous one that people may have heard of was a fellow named Absalom Boston from over on Nantucket. He was the first, you know, whale captain of color there. He also, his, his mom was Native American and his dad, you know, was, you know, was an African, you know, or an African descendant, an African descendant. His family were slaves as well. Well, then you go on and you find more and more and more. So the savings presentation, I want to talk a little bit about those two guys, a fellow named Amos Haskins, who identified, I believe, as a Native American, Amos Smalley, who was certainly identified as a Native American, Joseph and Joseph Blaine, who was, who was another Native American. Um, Joseph Blaine, Amos Smalley are from here on the island of Martha's Vineyard. That's kind of crucial to the conversation. Fundamentally, all of whaling, all of whaling as we know it today, occurred on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard in New Bedford, and, um, and the, the, the area of Sag Harbor, as they call it, on Long Island. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, one, um, the Northeast had the infrastructure required for whaling. Um, deep harbors close to large oceans where they could take the ships out, you know, and, and hunt for these whales. Because when whaling began, 
Yes, you could get in your 35, 40 foot sloop, you know, and go out and hope that you would, you know, discover a whale, you know, by accident. But as time wore, as time wore on, these ships became massive, hundreds and hundreds of tons, you know, of ships. But the average whale ship as we know it today was about 100, 120 feet, which by the way, that's the Charles W. Morgan is about, you know, that, that size. Which sounds large, but it's a little on the diminutive size. If you put it in perspective, um, you know, for example, the size of an average American home. If you took two or three average American homes and put them together back and back and hollow them out, you would be on roughly, that's roughly the size of a whale ship. Well, there are somewhere between 20 and 36 people aboard that whale ship to fulfill its purpose, find the whale, kill the whale, harvest it, bring its products back to shore, and go out and, and do it again. <clears throat> In the doing of that, you know, a, a, a lot went on. But what people don't realize is many of the people who went whaling did it because, oh, this is just so romantic. We've, we've all claimed to have read Moby Dick. I know there are only nine of you out there who actually did read the complete book. And from what we know about it, you know, this, was a ro this is a romantic story. You know, this is wonderful. The fact is about 175,000 people went whaling over its history, and about 90% of them only did it once. That was because the conditions were just awful. I have yet, you know, now I've been involved in whaling since 2014. From 2014 when I started this article and completed this book in 2017, I devoted most of my waking time towards learning about, you know, this business and this industry. And in all that time, I have yet to find anything that was appealing. It was uncomfortable. It was dangerous. It wasn't that rewarding in all cases, although when it was, it was a bonanza. But the fact is, those 20 or 36 folks were going to spend three and a half to four years together on average on this very, very, very tiny ship you know, where discipline was such that they didn't outlaw flogging until 1850. That's how business, how bad the business was. Um, and, and I've been asked, you know, what is what are some of the worst parts? You know, let's just get that out of the way. One of the worst stories that I've read about whaling <clears throat> was how the shipmate didn't mind being covered when he woke up with roaches in the evening because they ate the bed bugs. That's one story. Another one was that they washed their clothes in urine. You know, now, I mean, the questions abound. I mean, you know, well, where did they get the urine from? Well, you know, probably a communal barrel. Why did they use it? You know, well, the, 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 <clears throat> the, the, the conditions of, of urine was such that, um, you know, they could cut through the grease, you know, so you could wash your clothes, um, so you could clean your decks. Of the remember, this is oil that was you know being harvesting. So they're just some of the worst parts. The bad parts were just pretty much every day. I, I think the typical sailor boarded a whale ship at age 17 or 18 years old, and with the blonde hair and the blue eyes, and I spent time with my girlfriend last night, and I'm gonna go away in this trip. I'm gonna come back as rich as Croesus. We're gonna buy the big house that you know, lines the waterfronts of New Bedford, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, you know, and of course the Hamptons, and we'll be rich and have a family and we'll be, we'll be settled. He probably got as far as the first buoy and, and then wound up throwing up and being seasick for the next, oh, maybe six or seven days. And that was his introduction into whaling. Those young men had other alternatives. They could go back and they can work in dad's store or they could work on the farm, or they could get a job somewhere in the community. These are occupations that were not available to the Cape Verdeans, to Native Americans, to the Black and West Indian people, and the Kanakas, as they were called, and the South Sea Islanders, you know, couldn't pursue those types of lifestyles. So they had a tendency, once they went whaling, to go again and again and again and again and again, which is the answer to America's first meritocracy. They did it so often, and there were times when stuff happens and you're 1,200 miles offshore and the captain gets sick or gets killed and they look for a replacement. Well, all folks cared about 
was who can get us home safely and catch more whales along the way. And invariably, it turned out to be people of color and provide them this opportunity. You know, now, I don't want this to, you know, to get out of proportion. So, you know, let me break it down and, and, and provide you with a couple of comparatives. You know, we're, we're fairly certain there were at least 51 of these men of color who became captains of whale ships. That's twice as many as black people who've been NFL quarterbacks, okay? And there's never going to be another whaling captain. So that's one perspective. Another one is, over those years, thanks to an, an, an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of documents and data that we have, I was able to use to write this story. About, there were 15,000, I think, 913 whale, sh whale trips. These were pursued by 2,700 different ships. There were 2,500 different captains. And of course, 175,000 you know, different men, 30 to 40% of whom probably were men of color who didn't have those opportunities. So that's kind of the, how did they pursue this industry? How did they get to be captains or management, you know, as it's called, you know, and then we can parse it down to, you know, to some of the Native Americans. I want to tell you a couple of stories about those guys, but I want to see if John had any questions or if there are questions, you know, that I haven't done this before. Okay. Uh, we do have some questions and uh, I'd like to offer one to kind of start things off. And then I see several others are coming in. Um, and I mentioned this the other day, just a little bit, but I, th I think it's quite interesting and I'd love to hear you talk about this a little. Uh, I really feel compelled to share with you how much this book came to mean to me as I moved through the reading of it. And while I'm confident that I have a very respectable level of knowledge about the historical experiences of Native Americans in this country. In reading this book, I was really drawn deeply into your information about the early intermarriages of Native Americans and Blacks. It is an important and very personal issue to me because on my mother's side of my family, there's a history of something that feels very strange. My great-grandmother, who was a documented full-blooded Cherokee, married a white man, and together they owned more than 100 slaves. I've long struggled to reconcile the irony of that part of my family history. In your book, you talk about the reasons that both Blacks and the Quakers encouraged intermarriage between Native Americans and Blacks. Can you talk about what you learned about why such marriages were both common and encouraged during the whaling era? Yes. <clears throat> um, and it gets into it, it gets into one of the, one of the more in, insidious aspects of all this, you know, that I found. Let me go back. Um, you know, I can certainly make a case that the island of Martha's Vineyard and its Native American Wampanoag community were the first, you know, to pursue whaling. Um, you know, that's from a an, an old story, an oral tradition told about a man named Moshe you know, a giant human being who actually used his toe to carve up the land in southeast, southeastern Massachusetts to form the Elizabethan Islands, which also include Nantucket, you know, and Martha's Vineyard. To feed his people, he would grab whales and kill them and, you know, use that, you know, use that for food for his folks. So that's kind of where the history started. But moving over to Nantucket, it was the Quakers the friends who are anti-abolition, who are abolitionists and anti-slavery, um, who when they got here, um, unfortunately, the Europeans, when they came to America, brought their diseases with them, and the Native American community was not able to sustain itself, you know, from this. Over on the Cape Cod side, there are probably 40,000 Native Americans, you know, at discovery, depending on how you'd like to use that expression, you know, or when the white man met the Native American for the first time. It didn't take too long before diphtheria, measles, smallpox, you know, other diseases, you know, really, really waylaid this entire population of Native Americans. It took a number of years, you know, we're talking, you know, mid 1600s to early 1700s. Um, and it was the Native Americans who became the harpooners who taught the white man about this new industry and showed them how to do it and helped them do it. Um, one, of, one of Nathaniel Philbrick's stories um, in, in his book, The Mayflower, 
was when the pilgrims made it over to Provincetown and were stunned to find the harbors themselves and the bay over there filled with whales. One guy tried to shoot him, got too excited, put too much gunpowder in it, blew the gun up, and you know, of course, you know, the whale or whale swam away away safely. But you know, these were the these were the. I mean, imagine being the Native American to to watch this knucklehead with the with the blunderbuss, you know, miss this whale. <clears throat> but in any event, after learning this, and the people started dying very rapidly. The Quakers decided that perhaps black people would be able to su su supplant this and take some of the Native Americans' place, you know, on these whale ships, which is exactly what happened, you know, over the years. Fast forward to get to the mid 1700s, however, um, and black people and Native Americans were said, if you marry and you have children your children will never be slaves because the Native Americans were free. Well, in fact, neither of those facts were true at that time in history. Um, you know, Native Americans hadn't been slaves, you know, since, oh, just past 1607, 1615, you know, people would say. <clears throat> um, there's literally no truth to your child, you know, not become, being a slave because there were fugitive slave acts in 1792 and 1850, you know, where a person could just point you out of a crowd, you know, if you were a person of color and say, that's my slave who ran away and I'm taking him back home with me. And they were allowed to do that, you know, through an act of, through acts of Congress. The reason though, and that's why we get around to this kind of insidious nature of things. If you, a black man or woman married a native American person, and if you had a child, the child was still a person of color, but was no longer a Native American and could not participate in the tribal culture, which made it easier as there became fewer and fewer and fewer Native Americans to take these people's land. As you know, we know a lot of my Native American friends, you know, we laugh and I tease them. I said, you know, we call it Thanksgiving. Y'all should call it Thanksgiving, you know, because that's pretty much, you know, what happened, you know, in the very, in the very onset. You know, we give Columbus, you know, quite a bit of quite a bit of credit. I don't know why, because here's a man who got lost, never discovered the place, and named the people he never met after the place he couldn't find, and calling them Indies. He was trying to find the West Indies. You know, you know, you never made it. He never set his feet on on the 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 physical continent of North America. Um, but this is the legacy, you know, that we have. The result of it was probably, you know, I, I read a, a bunch of, you know, wonderful geneolo genealogical studies, but probably in the mid 1700s, certainly by the late 1700s, it'd be very difficult to find someone in southeastern Massachusetts who was only a Native American. Yes, there still are, you know, yes, there are still a few, but thanks to the disease and the intermarriage, we have a people who fundamentally have lost their culture all around the industry of whaling. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, let's move to some of the questions that have, are coming in. The first one is, uh, what is the most surprising thing you've learned about whaling since starting your research? There, <laughs> well, considering, you know, my knowledge base was zero, fundamentally all of it. But the most surprising which, which kind of goes overlooked, um, is the whale itself. Today we know, for example, um, you know, you know, whales, there, there was a, there, um, in Philip Hoare's book, he, 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 did, he has a story. Um, you know, <clears throat> some, some folks found a whale carcass. Inside of it, they found a harpoon. They carbon dated the harpoon to find that this whale had to have been at least 220 years old. So we have the largest creatures on the entire planet who have probably outlived our entire country. These are the largest creatures <clears throat> whose heartbeats are about eight times, a, uh, eight times a minute, as I believe, you know, who can dive thousands of feet deep, who may have their own religion, who definitely have families, who the U.S. Navy and everyone else knows they do have their own form of communication, vocal communication, 
Um, yeah, these are things, you know, we didn't know. That was a surprise. Also, I'm on my own, I, I, I'm now that I'm meeting, you know, some of the very respected members of the whaling community, um, although we have, you know, a, a wealth of wonderful data, we haven't been able to determine how many whales were killed over all of these years. But I want to give you a ballpark. It's on the order of 300,000. Um, whose products are worth about $10 billion, you know, over its entire industry. That's $10, $10 billion in, in today's money. But that was, that was kind of a, that was kind of a surprise. And the bad part of it is the whaling industry had probably ended for close to 50 years before we knew any of this information. Very that good. was kind of a surprise. And Thank I, you. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I was, of course, surprised that, you know, someone could be a captain in charge of white folks aboard a whaling vessel, you know, you know, during the American Revolution, you know, in the War of 1812 and well before slavery ended. Yeah, for sure. Who would have thought that? Um, the next question comes from a communication major. And the question is, how have you incorporated your experience in communication to your writing, and has that experience set you up for success in writing? Oh my goodness, great question! And, and first, absolutely, um, two things. You know, you know, one one is everyone everyone gets something. You know, you know, you know. I'm I, I'm not a religious person, but in in the Bible it says, you know, don't hide your talent underneath the bushel. <clears throat> um, my gift was I was I was able to read. You know, very young and very fast. So of course that has helped. You know, throughout the career. And with the at the end of my career with with writing this book, along the way in the radio business, though, you know, I was a, I was I was a deal guy. Uh, I got to a point where you know I was one of very few people who who um you know knew how to you know evaluate, buy, and sell radio stations. I, I'd say my radio career, I probably oh generate about a half billion dollars worth of you know revenue and radio station sales and you know building companies and building organizations and you know and and products. Much of that, though, I was able to do because of um, um, because of spreadsheets. I actually used to use VisiCalc, and I learned how to use Lotus One Two Three. I'm still teased by my, you know, coworkers that I do use Lotus One Two Three, because one of my geek buddies gave me a hot copy of it, and I can translate the work I do in it into Excel, which is the more familiar spreadsheet people are aware of. So first, I was able to organize a tremendous amount of data on spreadsheet. You know, by that, you know, you know, you know, how fast is the whale? Well, I probably have, you know, 15 or 20 notes from various books in a spreadsheet. So I can just look up whale and then speed and find that answer, which helped in writing the book. Um, you know, also was learning when when you when you borrow a hundred million dollars or more and I have from from a bank or you raise that kind of money through a public or private offering, um, you know, there's a period of what's called due diligence and people want to know, well, how do you make, you know, those determinations? What are your assumptions and how do you back those up? So that taught me how to keep notes of where did I find the information? Um, it was really unique because since I knew nothing, it was all brand new. So it's having, you know, a way, a method spreadsheet and a place inside of that, to generate this information so I can record it and report it back essentially, which is what I'm doing in telling this story. Coincidentally, thanks to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, um, the, you know, the repository of the majority of this data, and I'll, I'll share with you a, a new thing that's come out of that. Back in the depression era, the Workers' Progress Administration decided to put some people to work, you know, people of, you know, lesser skills, you know, than going out and, you know, banging nails, for example, but, you know, writers, they put them to work and putting the information about whaling on these index size cards, which have been saved over the years. Because most of whaling occurred during our many wars, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, Civil War, um, you know, our whale, our whaling industry was so big that it was attacked you know, to harm our country. The money was so large, it, you know, you know, that supplied the money to, you know, so that we could afford to build warships and go to war, you know, and fight back with folks. 
But also, when those people got on board those ships, they had a piece of paper that they that someone filled out for them called the the Siemens Protection Certificate, you know, or the Siemens Protection Papers. And that functioned in years before there was such a thing as a passport, so that if the British came upon your whale ship, you could prove through this piece of paper, you know, that you're an American citizen, and they couldn't gratuitously take you aboard and put you to work, you know, or go and fight for their for their company. Well, having all that data, the the um, Judith, Judith Lund. Um, who wrote, you know, the, 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 the books, you know, American Whaling, um, encapsulated this data, and they in turn put all this information on spreadsheets. So one day I was able to be in the, in the library of the New Bedford Whaling Museum and meet the librarian, Mark Prochnick, who said, oh, we have a lot of that information on a spreadsheet. Would you like to look at it? And I'm like, you know, oh, I thought I died and gone to heaven. You know, here was a familiar tool um, that I've used very well over the years. So I was able to, you know, go in there. And I, I think that first one, um, to, to, to give you uh, the scope of it, was about 120,000 lines of information long and about 18, 20 columns wide. So you could see um, where the person was born, where they shipped from, um, how old they were, what color was their skin. Now you can see how important that became to me. What was their eye color? What was their hair color? So once given all this information, you know, and, and then Mark says, well, you know, hey, I can email it to you. Then I had died and gone to heaven. So I came and I played with it just as I would as had I, you know, like I did in the radio station business days. So I was able to data sort, as the term is, all of these hundreds of thousands of people based upon their color. Okay, and then I could have all the people who said that they were black, you know, and then I could see which what their rank was, you know, which ones were the captains. And then, then of course, as I learned more and I found that, again, that construct black really didn't work, you know, because, if, you know, besides how people self-identify, it's also how people identify you. So had you been a slave or no, had you been an African and you're on a ship and you're brought over here. Chances are, you know, there may have been intercourse aboard that ship. And when that female slave got here, had a baby. And that baby was not perhaps as black as the mom. And maybe close to the color of the dad. Run that out three or four generations over maybe a 40, 60 year period of time. And there became a time when you couldn't tell just by looking at someone, even today, what race they were. Today, if you walk to the city of New Bedford, for example, I defy you to determine who's black, who's Cape Verdean, who's Spanish, you know, you know, you know, who's, you know, who's white. Um, and there are many major cities, urban areas where that's true now. Now, I'm getting way off the, the topic, but, you know, you know, yes, um, those, that spreadsheet in particular was extraordinary. I, I couldn't I could not have done this without a spreadsheet and be that crew list, which now today is far more refined. Um, the New Bedford Whaling Museum and Mystic Seaport have now constructed a brand new website. And I mean, by brand new, I mean it's it's less than a month old, and it has everything you would ever want to know about whaling, including a lot of those, you know, those spreadsheets. Thank you so much. Uh, let me quickly say thank you to Kaylee and Kylie for those first two questions, and move along to Elijah, who poses a question that I think perhaps those of us who are a little older might have a little bit better understanding of, but uh, certainly for young people, I think it'd be a very common question. Why don't more people know about these important stories of black captains? There's, there hasn't been a, there hasn't been a lot of incentive, um, but it's not just that story. You know, here's, you know, we only have learned the story of the whale since slavery, you know, for example. I, I, I think, I, I think, you know, life, you know, gets down to the theme song of the old Cheers TV show, You Like to Go Where People Know Your Name. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. Um, evidently, according to the New York Times 1619 study, people from Africa were brought here in 1619. There's 388,000 
people don't realize it was that few. On one hand, it's that many, but on the other hand, it's that few. You know, in context, we killed more, we killed fewer whales than we brought people here to become slaves in America. In 1865, 3.9 million black people, former slaves, were freed. So in that period of time, those 388,000 humans were fundamentally harvested to grow more, all right, to supplant and assist with the economy of the United States. You know, so why don't we know more about that? You know, well, you know, if you if you read, I encourage you to do so, skip Gates' book, Stony the Road, I think what you'll find is while the North won the war, we lost the argument because post the Civil War in the area of Reconstruction, um, you know, you will find that most people don't believe Civil War was about slavery. <laughs> and, and of course it was from, from anything that you want to read. But there's not a lot of incentive anywhere um, for people to look down, okay, to look down the road, to look down the hands of time, to find out why did some of these things exist, you know, and, and, and make things more important. You know, there is, there is a, here's, here's another example. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the Native American man, Moship, okay, you know, who talked about whaling, you know, in the very first place. Now, this is pre-1600. This is sometime after the Ice Age 9,000 years ago when, you know, when, when this occurred. Well, we don't believe that story because it's an oral tradition that's never been written down. Well, that's not all. The Wampanoag tribe, if you will, is only now for the last, oh, 15 or so years, been reteaching its native language because it was fundamentally lost over all of that time. And that's part of progress. You know, you know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, talk about how bad all this is and, and how negative, but, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of stories that haven't been told until the people involved tell them, until you and the audience, you know, you know, you know, you know, thankfully, you know, you and you enjoy reading, try writing, try writing about your history and tell some of these stories. We all saw the movie Hidden Figures. You know, that was one I liked. It was a wonderful, wonderful movie. My wife and I, you know, drove home. We're halfway home and all of a sudden it occurred to me, that didn't happen in the years of slavery. I was in like the eighth grade. Why do I not know this story? Well, the same is true, you know, particular things that are not altogether as negative, certainly, you know, as whaling or slavery. And I think that probably has a lot to do with it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, our next question comes from Abigail. Are there any insights about In the Heart of the Sea by Nathaniel Philbrick that you could share with us? Or what did you think of the book? <clears throat> um, I love Nat. I love the book. I love all of his books. By the way, read his new one about uh, President Washington. It's you know, it's it's, it's just amazing. Um, and, and Nathaniel Philbrick was the first person to blurb my book, so you know, I'm I'm a huge fan. And I'm going to be doing another one of these um, for Herrick. Um, oh, in about two weeks, and I plan to focus on that. But here you go. Um, first, the story of the whale ship Essex. Uh, tells how bad whaling was. This is the worst story that ever occurred. Okay, where you know, you know, thirty souls went aboard a whale ship. A whale attacked the ship. By the way, that's something that's only happened seven times ever out of all of these whales. Um, so it's a very good story. It happens to be a true story. Um, and and you know, Mother Nature is involved in time away from home and cannibalism. You know, I can't imagine things you know too bad about that. But I think folks don't realize there were seven black people aboard that ship. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. Um, one of them, one of them deserted. He was the smart one, as it turns out. Um, uh, five were cannibalized and, and the rest of them died, you know, in various ways. I love the book. I also like the movie. Uh, my whaling friends pick on the movie. They say that in those days, the Quakers that you see didn't wear black, they wore gray. And at the very end of the movie, there's a scene with the swallows, you know, birds, you know, flying away. And apparently those birds don't exist on Nantucket. But professional whaling people, you know, have to have something to pick on. 
I absolutely loved it. I loved it. I loved the movie. I like the book better because, you know, the, you know, that the, the book gives you the prospect, the possibility for that theater of the mind, you know, uh, while Nat's telling you that, you know, they're 1200 miles offshore and land nowhere in sight. There's no food, there's no water. Well, then your imagination takes over and you get us for a true sense of how bad it was. I have a question from uh, Kylie next, and it says, Mr. Fenley, I so appreciate how much you love history. I do too. What is one historical story you've encountered that may be untold that you think we should all know? Man, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, in in whaling, it's a it's a little it's a little on the perverse side, but we tend to think of our historical people figures as heroes. You know, well, you know, there was one of my captains who was a total scoundrel. <laughs> yeah, he, he was an outright crook, um, and and I, um, you know, Gonzalez, and and I really enjoy that. <laughs> you know, the fact, you know, he he captained a ship to take an exposition, ex, uh, uh, historical expedition somewhere up in Canada and stole the boat, left the people to die. You know, I, you know, you know I, I know that's kind of left of center. You know, I'm sorry for my maybe perhaps twisted sense of humor, um, but but history is not all heroes. And, and I think that's a, that was something that I learned. Very good. Um, Abigail asked, are there any black whaling captains from Nantucket? Yes. As a matter of fact, there's a fellow named Absalom Boston. There's a person named um, Peter Green, and there's a person named um, 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 Edward. Edward. Um, oh my goodness, I forget his last name. No, oh, bear with me for a second. I'll I'll think of it. Um, and I thought there was another named Samuel Harris, but as it turned out, you know, even though he's in my book, you know, I was incorrect about that. You know, we have since learned new information that the two sources I had used to identify. This person, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't correct, but yes, you know, there were. Okay, very good. Uh, give me just one moment here. My screen just went a little bit crazy, so I'm going to try to get back to where I was. Okay, very good. Um, it's interesting, uh, Kylie. Thank you. Kylie has uh, put forth a question, uh, wondering if I have any more questions, and based on uh, what I'm seeing right now, it looks like we have the opportunity to answer another one. So I'm going to ask this one of you. Um, the title of your book states that whaling was America's first meritocracy. While the book clearly supports that the whaling industry offered opportunities for success among blacks that were rarely seen in other areas of employment, the book also seems to make clear that even the whaling industry did not function untouched by racism. Do you see such a conclusion as an accurate assessment of what life was like for black and Latino whaling captains in terms of how they had to live and how they were impacted by their race? Yes, most most definitively. There's a there's a picture that I discovered at the um <clears throat> at at the um, New Bedford Whaling Museum, and it's called Set Two. And it's a hand drawing. It's been colored in. It's on a piece of canvas. Um, we don't know the author, but we know it was it was um, it was produced on the whale ship Ore Taft in 1864. Consider that year. And the title of it is set to, and the description is the cook in the, in the middle of a fight with the steward. <clears throat> one is black, one is not. And I think that tells the story right there because there was nowhere in 1864 on land that a black man could look a white man in his eye, much less raise his hands to him in anger. Um, this happened quite a bit. I also, um, I, spent a, I, I spent a good deal of time, um, you know, with some, with some other areas, you know, that I, I touch upon in the book. You know, one is use of the N-word, you know, which is, you know, very, very widely used as, you know, as you can imagine, you know, particularly in those days and, you know, in those times. Turns out that word was rarely used on a whale ship because on a whale ship, if you use that to a black man, the guy could kill you and get away with it. Okay, you had to maintain that order, that discipline. You know, people people don't understand 
of, you know, the nature of, you know, being on a tiny, on a diminutive vessel for three and a half or four years with, you know, 20 or 30 guys. Um, and those 20, 30 guys often change because many times when you got on the whale ship, the first thing you wanted was to get off. And I've seen the numbers, some studies that, you know, you know, upwards of 35, 40% of all the people who were on whale ships actually deserted and they had to go to different stops and, and renew the crew, you know, if you would. But that, that was, that was pretty, that was pretty astounding. The other one, by the way, was, um, you know, was, was sex. I'm not going to get all steamy here. Um, but ironically, all of whaling occurred during the Victorian era. So, you know, you didn't have, you know, the, the perception, you know, as you do in prisons today, you know, of homosexuality, you know, that just didn't occur. You also didn't have the space. The space allotted to you on a whale ship was all about the back seat of your SUV. And you got to live there for three and a half or four years. And that's where you ate and converse with other crew members. Uh, well, it, well, it was bad. Well, it was bad. Very good. Um, just a quick follow up on that comment you were just making, because for those who haven't had the opportunity to read the book, I think that was one of the things that really struck me was how long the voyages were. So that's the first part of this question. And the second part is, and I had made a note here to just pose this question. Is there any evidence or history of any women ever being involved in the whaling industry? As a matter of fact, yes. Um, there, there are two good books, one by Lisa Norling, Captain Ahab, Ahab Had a Wife. Um, there's another one, um, Lisa Norling and, um, and um, Clay, Claiborne, Claiborne, I'm forgetting the last name, Margaret, Margaret Claiborne. Uh, but there's this, is, um, um, you know, iron, iron women, iron, iron men in wooden ships. But yes, no, there, I, no one has been able to identify a female whaling captain. Mm -hmm. But yes, wives went aboard whale ships. Um, two, of, two of my guys, several of my guys, um, two that I can recall, um, um, Valentine Rosa had his wife and children aboard ship when the ship wrecked you know, and was totally destroyed, but they managed to, you know, to get away safely. Another one, William T. Shorey, um, was, had his wife aboard and had to leave her in Hawaii because she was pregnant to have the baby and then come back and pick them up. So yes, there are instances of that. There, there is an apocryphal story, which I believe to be true, of a woman who enlisted to join on a whale ship and pretended she was a man. And it took several months for them to finally realize that she was not at which point they dropped her off home. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you say just a little bit more uh, so that everybody understands just how long these trips lasted and how far they went? Okay. <clears throat> um, the longest whale trip was 11 years and 10 months. To put that in perspective, they had three different captains. The entire crew, you know, was changed. That's a pretty long time to do anything. You know, that's, you know, that's a career, you know, in itself. Right. Yes, there were shorter ones when, you know, you go out and you'd be out there for three, four months and come back. You know, um, a whale. each of those 15,000 whale trips was a separate business enterprise. Whaling was a model of what we today know as the venture capital industry or hedge funds and private equity firms. Very similar structure, sharing the wealth, sharing the defeat, you know, along along the way. Um, in the in the doing, however, when you were ordered the 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 owners would order management to go out and hunt whales and return when the ship's hull was full with oil, filled with oil or baleen, you know, or whale bone. So that dictated how long you're going to be out there. And if you came back with an empty ship, you might not get your next captaincy. So there was incentive, both positive and negative, to perform, you know, but it was our first performance-based business, you know, which again ties into the meritocracy. You know, you know, I tease people and say the next time we had a meritocracy, they called it the NBA. You know, that, that's a little... <laughs> That's a little left of center. I get that, but you know, but come on, you know, we're we're, we're probably not going to hire the shortest person 
you know, who can't dunk a basketball <laughs> to join the team. And that was also true in Whaley. Okay. Um, another quick question here. In the book, it uh, talks about the difference between sperm oil and oil from the wet rest of the whale. Can yes. you explain that for maybe those who haven't had the opportunity to read the book? Yes. And and that's something that it's it's not something that you would deduce, you know, as well. Um, back in the back in the revolutionary days, okay, um, our homes were heated by fire inside the house, you know, or if you're a Native American inside your teepee. And that was your light. So, you know, when it got dark, people went to sleep. And when it got light, people would get up. Um, and then we figured out a way to make candles out of tallow, excuse me, which is, you know, from deer bones, you know, for, you know, for lack of a better description of it. Um, but when those candles burned, they emitted, you know, this, this black soot, if you will, which covered our, our walls. So, you know, back in the early days of America, we lived in hovels with, with blackened walls. And all of a sudden, sperm whale oil came along. Well, whale oil, A, burns cleaner. Now, the sperm whale has two kinds of oil on it. Um, one is the spermaceti, which is located in its head. And that's the highest price, the most valuable part, because when it's burned, it didn't leave any smoke at all. So consider when you cook, when you eat, when you want to read, if you had a book, you know, being covered with soot, now you have this whole, you know, new thing. So sperm, spermaceti, you know, that became the wealthy person's luxury. The rest of its oil could also be used, but it emitted a little bit more. But comparatively, whale oil emitted almost no soot as compared with everything else that we were using at the time. So it's a very efficient product. Very good. Um, I'm not seeing other questions, but I, I will ask one more for sure. Um, as I was reading the book, I noticed that you explained that there's a, a system of pay based on uh, whatever the rank was of the person working, wow. and then the captain takes a certain portion. But yeah. one of the things that struck me was in different places, it seemed like in some cases a captain might make as much as an eighth or a twelfth of the total haul, and others a fifteenth, and others a twentieth. Why did that vary so much? And was the race of the captain a factor in that at all? Surprisingly, no. I, you know, okay. that, and that's that's simply astounding. But let me go back to the business model. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and just generally. A whale ship costs between forty and sixty thousand dollars today's money, not not bad, but forty and sixty thousand dollars. Now that was if you bought the ship, if you built the ship, if you restored the ship, you know, if you equipped the ship for a whale trip. So the you know the the management captain crew go out find the whales, return with the products, which is the you know the spermaceti at the top, the rest of regular whale oil, whale oil from whales that were not sperm whales. Um, the baleen from the roofs of the mouth, you know, of these whales that were not sperm whales. When all of a sudden done, they got back there and there was a market for it. And people would, you know, reward you by buying um, your 2,000 barrels of oil for, you know, $2.50 a gallon. Well, the first thing that would happen was the owners, they would take their $40,000, $60,000 out of it and they would distribute equitably the rest of the proceeds or the profits, okay? And these are just rough numbers. You know, sometimes, you know, you had to make a deal. If you want a job, you had to take what was being offered. Generally, though, the captain would get about one-tenth of the proceeds of the profit. Then the his his crew, his boat steer, his first mate, second mate, third mate, or whatever, they may get one-twentieth. Well, as the, as the years wore on, by the time it was only the Cape Verdeans who were left, okay, they may only get one two hundredths of the profit of a whale trip. Okay. So there's many, many, many times when, you know, and, and instances when people come back after those three and a half or four years and not only not make any money, but still owe money to the company 
for the clothes that you wore and the tobacco that you were offered or whatever, you know, you know, liquor you participated in while you were aboard ship. But yes, to my surprise, the black people, the Native American captains were all paid every bit as well as anyone else. Very good. Thank you. I have one final question from the audience. Um, Abigail wonders, what is your favorite whaling story to tell? I don't, I don't tell it much, um, but it's, it's um, one of the captains named Joseph Benton. Joseph Benton was, you know, one of the very few, about 45 captains who was actually killed by a whale. You know, not some other, you know, dramatic occurrence falling off the mast or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was, he was, he was a tough guy. He was, you know, Cape, you know, Cape, Cape Verdean, hard guy, you know, now, you know, by hard guy, I mean, I'll get back to that story for a second, but here's your experience in a whale ship. The captain, who is not a doctor, was given a box, a medical box, and each of the little things in the box has a number to it. So if something happens, it's like, you know, you know, if you give them this, this is this is the benefit for a person, you know, who's sick you know, or under the weather or, or whatever. On one of those trips, you know, the, it turned out they needed, the captain needed number 11, and there was no number 11 in the kit. It was all gone. So he got a five and a number six and mixing the kither. <laughs> dude lives. <laughs> oh my goodness. This now, but this is this is the this is the omnipotence of a whale ship captain. Anyway, on one of Joe Benton's trips, two of the guys get into a fight. Um, and you know, you know, there's there's no fighting on a whale ship. It's as simple as that. And, and if you do, if you get caught, what he did with him, he tied one of the guys up to the mast by his thumbs. Can you imagine. First, they tied it by your thumbs. Wait, wait, wait. It gets worse because then his feet are about an inch off the ground. So while the whale ship is pitching and yawing, you know, he's dragged by some. Anyway, the reason that happened to him, he comes up, you know, the two get in a fight. Cam says, what the hell is going on here? Stop this, you know, right now. You know, what's the deal? And one of them, the guy who's not black, says, um, I'm tired of this N-word messing with me. Every time I lay down and go to sleep, he comes over and he farts on my head. <laughs> um, you know, for calling the N word. And, and Joe Benton says, you know, first of all, you don't call my men that because I'm a man of color myself. And then strung him up. So, you know, again, that's that's my sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Um, as we kind of draw to a close now, Skip, let me ask you, is there... Anything that, as we're kind of ending this discussion, that you especially want us to know or that you would encourage us to learn more about? I No, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not an educator, you know, to you know, be candid. And, and I really don't have that much empathy, <laughs> you know, again, to, you know, to, to be candid. I, in the, early in the show, I said I was one of the least mature people you're ever going to meet, you know, so I've, you know, kind of put that in, in, a, in a little box. Um, but if you can tell a story, I think you ought to. If you can write the story down, it would even be better. Um, and to write a story, you have to do, you have to do some homework. You know, you, you got to get in there. Um, I, I, I happen to be a professional researcher. It works well for me. I enjoyed doing it. But I also said, um, you know, when I began this, I didn't begin to write a book. I didn't begin to write anything about black whaling captains. I didn't know there was such a thing. But, you know, curiosity um, took over. It, you know, it, it met somewhere between my ADHD and my OCD. And here we are. <laughs> Well, it has been such a pleasure for us to be able to hear from you this evening, to get to know you a little bit and learn a lot more about the, the whaling industry, which I doubt that very many of us knew much about coming into this. Wanting to be respectful of everyone's time and busy schedules, I'll now draw our conversation to a close. I want to extend special thanks to Tabitha Burink for her introduction, to our incredible production manager, Kaylee McKee, to Zach Calvino for his technical assistance, 
and to Deb Van Dynen, the amazing executive director of the Big Reed Lakeshore. And above all, Skip, we want to thank you. Uh, it has been such a, a special opportunity for us to get to meet you and hear from you. Uh, we certainly wish you the best uh, with your book and in all of your future endeavors. And uh, I know earlier I saw a little conversation between you and Deb. And uh, when this is all over with COVID and so forth, we would absolutely love to have you come visit our lovely uh, community of Holland and uh, visit Hope College and uh, learn more about us and have give us the opportunity to learn more about you. Uh, thank you all in the audience for joining us this evening. Please check the Big Reed Lakeshore schedule and make plans to take full advantage of the awesome events yet to come in this year's Big Reed Lakeshore program. Today's events are the kickoff of a full slate of exciting activities. For a full calendar of events, simply go online and enter the words Big Reed Lakeshore. There are 50 more events planned for the 2020 Big Reed Lakeshore. Don't miss your chance to take full advantage of these many opportunities to learn. Thank you and good evening. Thank you.